Excellencies, friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to our weekly Monday lectures in Yarmouk Cultural Center. Tonight's lecture, entitled New Light on the Merchants and Rulers of Dilmon by Dr. Trudy Kawami. We suspected that the far-sailing merchants of Dilmon were a diverse group with contacts from the Indus to Mesopotamia and recent finds in the elite Bronze Age tombs at Al Ali, Bahrain, show that the rulers of this mercantile coast were also well traveled. Today, the best known Amorite ruler is Hammurabi of Babylon. It is now clear that the Amorite rulers regioned in the Gulf as well. The connections of the Dilmon merchants reached farther than once thought international indeed. Dr. Trudy Kawami is a noted scholar of ancient Near Eastern and Central Asian art. She retired as the director of research at the Arthur Sackler Foundation. And in 2015, uh, that was in 2015, and she is currently working with the Dar on a book of element objects in the collection. She was also the curator of the Bronze Age section of the splendors of the ancient East, antiques from a Sabah collection. Ladies and gentlemen, please make sure you turn off your phone and welcome our lecturer for tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is this, okay, yes, it's on. I'm so delighted to be back here, particularly when the weather is so beautiful, and I just left freezing, sleety New York. Um, so yes, this is <laughs> where I want to be, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, tonight, I wanna talk a little bit about the new information we have about uh, the Dillman merchants, and we now know more about the rulers who were involved in this trade as well. We're all familiar with the very early, um, okay, um, with the early traders of, of Dilmun, <coughs> And here, of course, we are at the moment, right there. And how they developed the trade from here, actually farther east, and up into Mesopotamia. Um, we now know a lot more about the beginning of this trade. Which we have good documentation of from the 21st century BC, because of the records in the archives that the third dynasty at Ur and Ur is right here, actually surprisingly near, um, that they were very much involved in the official trade. So we have lots of documents from Ur and they talk about uh, the trade as if Ur controlled it. And the assumption has been that, yes, it, it, it entirely controlled the trade. However, we're now beginning to realize that there is another level under that, the unofficial trading that went on as well. And of course, the records from Ur are always from Ur's point of view. I show here um, uh, two documents from the best known rulers, the Ur III dynasty, the uh, Ornama, who is shown here making an offering to his deity, and his son Shulgi, uh, and this is one of his foundation pegs where he shows himself as a pious builder carrying the first load of clay for a brick on his head. Now, if he actually did this, I wouldn't bet money on it, uh, but he liked to show himself because his father, it's the same thing. Here is Ornama down here, and he's carrying... Uh, a hoe, 
He's got a carry basket right here, so he's going to pick up some clay for a brick. And, but of course, his servant is behind him supporting the whole thing. Um, so that these, these very mercantile-oriented or, uh, uh, rulers had in the past sort of, you know, assumed that we assumed that they, they controlled the trade. But we know that trade was even earlier because over a hundred years before Ornama and his uh, dynasty, we know that the Queen of Lagash, and let me see, Lagash is right there. The Queen of Lagash sent gifts to the Queen of Dilmun. Now, we don't know what they were, but there is a record in the archive that stuff was sent. So already we have the rulers giving each other presents. You know, my sister queen, take this, please enjoy it. And in a list of, also from Lagash, of temple gifts to the god, there was, one of them was a copper model of a Dilmun boat. And we're, this is way before Ornama, so we've gotten a very early evidence of trade going on. People in southern Mesopotamia think Dilmun is a fabulous place, and their luxury goods are moving back and forth through there. Of course, by the end of the 20th century BCE, uh, Urnama's dynasty collapses, the, the third dynasty of Ur loses its oomph, um, and the, f the trade falls apart, or we assume the trade falls apart. But of course, it doesn't, and what we now know from new excavations is that the whole network, which we would think of as running, here's Lagash, and Ur, and Phylaka, goes all the way down to Bahrain, where it now seems that the rulers who ran the other end of the trade were developing a very large and complex culture. And we know this from the archaeology. It's particularly been the last four or five years. A lot of material has been published, and it's the Danish archaeologists working with the Bahraini archaeologists that have um, done so much work in this. We know by... 2000 BC, if not slightly earlier, down here, they're starting to have evidence of a very large and complicated culture. We're getting city wall built, large stone public buildings, or at least the foundations are stone, and large, complicated, well, uh, temple, there's a place called the Barbar -Bar Temple, named after the village, and the whole ruin is good twice the size of this room, um, so that there's something very active going on. But what has been most interesting is to see the, and here's, of course, Phylaka, which is the pivot point of all of this, and the, the merchants who are doing the work. And you notice they have all kinds of different seals this is a Mesopotamian-style cylinder seal. And the inscription is Avgina. Sailor from a big ship. Sailor probably isn't right. It's, it's, he's, he would be the master of the big ship and his, then his father's name. And of course, big ship is like a freighter, a tanker. It's carrying goods in a distant. Um, typical is the round file like a stamp seal, and here we have this man sitting in a boat, and its mast, and its sail. And here, another type, which is square with a gabled back. Again, someone in a boat, so boat imagery is very important. And, but just noticing that there's all different kinds of seals, even though, of course, we're familiar, the more numerous ones are these round ones, which you've seen, I'm sure, a lot. Um, so that this is a very varied group. But when we begin to look at, again, down here in Bahrain, 
about 2000 BCE, there are developed these burial mounds that are huge and extensive, and they become bigger and more complex as time goes on. Um, I show here the, the best known is the one from Ali village, uh, which has in it 11,100 mounds. And in all of Bahrain, there are over 75,000 of these mounds. Now, when you think about Phylaka, and there's just a few pictures, you realize that, you know, we don't have anything like that on Phylaka. We have no mounds or burials to speak of because it wasn't where they lived long term. It's the trading depot. The sailors come through, they're changing, you know, transshipment of goods, they've got warehouses and such. But the heart of the ruling population seems to have been down in Bahrain, where they start building a few mounds, and then they become more and more. And then by the 19th century BCE, they start getting bigger. But they're not, and here is even 1956. You can see these mound fields. Um, it's actually a World Heritage Site now because there's nothing like these massive amounts of mounds. And this is what always knocks my socks off, the air views. And this is only a part of them. Now, you notice in this view, the mounds are all pretty uniform. But in other areas, particularly where the land rises up and the view is good, the mounds are of a different type. They are big. They are as, as wide as 90 meters. They have walls around the outside of the mound. And it's very clear that these clusters, these special ones, are the ruling families. And we start seeing in Bahrain the development of a complex culture with clearly some peoples whose mounds are bigger and better than everybody else's, medium-sized ones, and then a whole lot of ordinary ones. And it is probably the wealth from the international trade that allows this huge spread of very ostentatious funeral practices. Um, the, you can't see it in this photo, but in some places the grouping of the mounds with a big one and smaller ones and then a lot of little ones implies a hierarchy. You know, not everybody is the same level anymore. So we're getting a complex society. And there are three different places where these complicated mounds are constructed. And so they have posited that they have three what they call lineages or three families, but in the wider sense, one might even say ruling clans who operate the southern end <laughs> of the Dillman trade. And these people have been, up until very recently, pretty much anonymous because, as you can see from the little holes all around, um, most of these tombs do not remain intact because when you have a field like this, you might as well have blinking lights and arrows. Tomb, dig here. But out of these 75,000, there are 46 of what they call ring mounds. And these are big, and they have walls around them. This is very broken down. You see this one here. You can tell even by looking at this that whoever is buried here is paramount to whoever was buried in here. And in turn, this person or family group is paramount to these smaller ring tombs around it. So you begin to get a sense of, of hierarchy in the culture. But these 46 ring mounds, these aren't just heaps of stone. They look like it now because, you know, time has not been kind to them and the climate can be very harsh. But even the small ones have a little built chamber inside and it's not sunk into the ground like the Egyptians do. It's on the top and then the mound is built over it using 
stone. And of course, over the years, you get all the, the, the dirt accumulating. So here we see three of these different ring mounds. And realizing that a lot of this on the top is not what they were originally. There was not that much dirt on the top. They looked, rather than like mounds, they looked more like short, squat towers. And inside, they had small structures. You can see the entrance here and here, a bit in there. So you might think of them as small stone houses above ground, which then have this big monumental mound put up over them. So don't think of them as, as tombs with a bunch of dirt on top. They're actually built structures. What's interesting also is in these 46 um, uh, ring mounds, 20% of the ceramics were from Babylon. And most of them were large jars, which, you know, those are the old-fashioned containers <laughs> that they were, things were shipped in, so that they have not only goods, but they have the pots that carried them, because, of course, that would be a little sign of status. But think of 20% of your ceramics from one region that's quite far away. Gives it a little indication now of how this, um, this trade is going. And here we have some from the Ali Mountain. You can see the very largest ones. Whoops. Built very nicely of stone. And of course, the problem with um, mounds of stone is if someone's looking to build a house, why go out and quarry the stone again when there's a big mound of it nearby? Um, so that it isn't just time that has deconstructed some of these. So we have these towers, tower-like tombs. We have the, at least several um, families, at least three families. Oh, and the bigger tombs are also on slight rises. And you never have two very big ring tombs near each other. It's as if you have to keep your distance. But they're sited where you can look from one edge of the wadi to the other and see your elite neighbor. You're just not living or dying next to him. So that there seems to be a certain balance or equilibrium between these three lineages that they all keep their distance and their hierarchy and they are polite at least in the placement of their tombs, um, which reflects probably some sort of the way the culture itself treated each other. So, but then we still don't know or didn't know who these people were, you know, who were the native Dilmanites. Um, because the tombs were generally <clears throat> looted, we have broken ceramics, we have broken stone, we have stuff like this, but of course there's very little in the way of precious material because that's been, shall we say, recycled. Uh, <laughs> long ago, but a few years ago, and we're excavating, the uh, Danes and the Bahraini archaeologists are excavating a large ring tomb and came upon some broken stone vessels inside because whoever had gone through it, and it probably was not in the recent past, it was a long ago, that uh, stone, dunk, can't use that, clunked. And this fragment, came up, and it's this lovely black polished stone with a wonderful inscription on it. And the inscription is for someone named Yagli El. And he is servant of the god Inzak of Agarum. Now that's the title that the Dilmun kings used. They didn't call themselves king. It's very interesting. But servant of the god Enzak. Um, who we know is worshipped in the <clears throat> in the Gulf. We don't know for sure where his main temple was. So we got a name, and the name turned out to be extremely interesting, because 
part of it. And another one said that he is Yagli El, the son of Remum. And that got everybody very excited because Remum is known, and he's been known since the mid 19th century in this fragment of fragmentary stone, and you see the inscription right here that says it's from the palace of Remum, servant of Enzak of Agarum. Again, so he's one of the, the Delmonite kings. But now we know that Yagli El was his son. So we've got father and son. And of course, what is most exciting about Yagli El is that the name it has a specific um, ethnic and linguistic origin, and that is he's an Amorite. And you go, well, you know, he doesn't call, he's not a Dilmanite. He has a name that is very popular up in Syria, in parts of central Mesopotamia. And the f language family is Northwest Semitic, which is quite different from the language they used, which was Akkadian. It's like if somebody's name was uh, Giuseppe, but he spoke English because that's where his father is. And what this tells us is that the rulers of Dilmun are a very mixed, varied bunch. They worship and call themselves a servant of the local god whose name is actually in Sumerian. And yet some of their personal names are from way up in the Northwest. And yeah, this is Thylaka's, the first indication, the inscription here, uh, the find uh, of the temple of Enzak, uh, which that fragmentary bowl, this was found by the Danes in the 1950s, and about six, seven years ago, a new excavation found one of the matching pieces. And maybe someone will come up with the rest of it because obviously the inscription would have been more. So we've got these Amorite kings down here. And they're not alone. They might be alone down in, in Bahrain, but we have Amorite rulers in Babylon. We've got them up in Mari, which is in southern Syria, way up at Ebla, at Ashur, in northern. Mesopotamia, and the Amorites are not an empire and not necessarily a tribe, but they were a people of a certain linguistic preference, and they used it in their names, um, who did very well in the first half of the first millennium BCE. There were ruling elites in various towns, and of course the best known is Hammurabi. We always think of Hammurabi of Babylon. Oh, he was a Babylonian. No, he wasn't. He was an Amorite. <laughs> but he was probably the most successful Amorite ruler. And of course, we know him from his great law code that I show here in a couple of views. It's now in the Louvre. And at the top of it, we have Hammurabi facing the sun god, who, of course, is the god of justice because he sees everything. And the whole rest of the piece of stone is covered with all his laws. So here's the laws, and because I am a pious person, and the god told me, and he sanctions what I do. So the rulers of Dilmun, the princes who are part of the great Dilmun trade, are part of this uh, group of linked rulers. Now we know who's down here. And it surprised the Dickens out of everybody because they were expecting it to come up with some kind of Dilmanite names or Sumerian names. And here they're from Northwest Semitic, which tells us how much everybody got around. It wasn't just the Dilmun merchants sail sailing from the Indus up to Ur. We always think we invented travel because we've got planes and cars and motorboats. People got around very well and sometimes surprisingly quickly in antiquity as well. 
So Hammurabi is part of this group. Now, Hammurabi had an interesting career, and one of the people he has some involvement with, way up in southern Syria at the site of Mari, uh, which is near the modern Deir es Salaam, um, was a very wealthy little state doing quite well in international trade and international relations. And we know a lot about Mari because when the building and the palace was sacked and collapsed, all their clay records stayed there. Some of them were a little slightly fired, some were not, but they were all there to be found years, centuries, millennia later, and read. There's still lots of Mari things that haven't been read. There are thousands of tablets. Everything from a school kid writing to his father, send me new clothes, so-and-so who sits next to me has better clothes than I do, and he is adopted. There's literally a letter like that, which shows how little human nature changes. So Mari, at this point, is being ruled by a guy called um, Zimmerlim. And his father ruled before him, and he had a wonderful palace. It's probably his father's palace. Um, and this is a reconstruction. It, the the uh, palm trees are fanciful, but it could well have been. Here's a bit of the palace was still extant to the second floor when it was excavated by the French in the 1930s. And in this courtyard was this wonderful statue of a water goddess, and she's a fountain. And her bowl actually is, has a pipe well, drilled down into it, it goes all the way down, and she stood and water flowed out of her her vessel, and Zimmerlin was very, very proud of this, among other things. Um, <clears throat> but he didn't have an easy career. He was driven out at one point and replaced by somebody else, but then he got along well with Hammurabi, and he's reinstated, and he rules for about 13 years. He has eight daughters some of whom get set off on diplomatic marriages, one of which fails in less than a year. She comes back home, and weeks later, she's sent out as a bride to somebody else. Um, and I don't think we see, have to see this as women being controlled. It was, she was like in the diplomatic corps. So Zimmerlim is living up here. He's doing very well. He has this huge archive. He's got money. He also sends some special oil and a special vase to his friend, the ruler, in Dilmun, so that we know there was direct contact and direct trade all the way from Mari, and we're in southern Syria now, all the way to Bahrain. And they're sending letters, you know, clay tablets. Well, things don't go well, ultimately, for <clears throat> Zimmerlim, and he runs afoul of his earlier patron, Hammurabi. And Hammurabi gets really tired of what's going on, and about 1760 comes up and trashes the place and kicks out Zimmerlim. We don't know what happened to Zimmerlim. He disappears from the historical record. Whether he died or whether he just went into exile or changed his name and started raising onions, you know, unclear at this point. The important thing about this, besides the fact that rulers from Mari to Bahrain were in contact, were sending each other gifts, was that these are all princes who are jockeying with each other. Hammurabi was sort of first among equals and was the better uh, strategy uh, person, but that we don't have an empire. There's no Amorite empire here. Um, it's maybe like the Italian Renaissance where you've got the princelings making alliances, breaking them, going with somebody else. All the same time, there is a very lucrative trade. And now we know that some of it involved perfumes and perfumed oils going from Mesopotamia down to Bahrain, along with fancy textiles. There was 
big textile trade, and we have lots of names of this kind of textile and that. We have no idea what they were because, you know, we don't have, they didn't have a dictionary of what the terms were for us. Um, but the big cities of Mesopotamia are producing fancy goods for export. Of course, we know what was going the other way. It was copper, it was hard stones, it was all those wonderful soft steatite and chloride, plus probably a lot of other things. Maybe even animals, like water buffalo, who came via the Gulf into Mesopotamia. So that we've got two-way trade here, and now we can watch it over nearly a thousand years. And we understand it a bit better because we see who's involved, even in Bahrain. It's the Amorites, or an Amorite prince and his son. Now, there's probably two other families down there because we don't, it was only luck that stone artifacts have survived, giving us these people's names and their, their patronymics. We need to know who the father's name was so we can put a generation together. So when we look then backwards from knowing this business, knowing the whole Amorite um, interplay, knowing even what Zimmerlim's career at Mari was and his connections to the Dilmun kings as well as Hammurabi, we can better understand how there is probably a political layer going over in this international trade. But at the same time, there's also the practical trading aspect of it, getting the stuff here and there with minimal stress. And that's, of course, where the merchants of Dilmun come in. The kings of Dilmun, or the rulers, the servants of the god Enzak, um, probably thought they were very significant because of the size of their tombs and how they worked that. But they didn't make the trade go. They helped manipulate it. They maybe made the initial contacts. But that it was the actual sailors and tradespeople on the boats that facilitated this sort of thing. Now, in this trade, of course, we come back to the central point of Phylica, which is where all the threads come together, where you have the Kings, and notice even the fact that, you know, Bahrain's an island and, and it's easy to keep things yourself and it has water where other places have uh, much less. And then here, all the way up past <laughs> the screen, the trade extended. But it's this central point here of Phylaka near enough to deal with these people. Sailing is pretty decent this way. So that Phylica becomes the pivot point. And we know a little bit more about the Phylica sailors, and here are their, their, their varied seals again. Um, and we know they show up in tablets and other places as well, even from Susa, which is in South Western Iran, there's a tablet that has three brothers loaning a certain amount of copper to a fourth party for a business trip. This sounds extremely modern. And the brothers are named Abba and Elamatum, and the third brother is Milkiel, another Amorite name. But his father's name is Temenzak, which is a good Sumero Dilmanite name. <laughs> so even in one family, you can't tell necessarily the ethnicity or the language of the people because mm, I like the name. We call the kid this, S which makes it feel very modern. And that by a person's name, all you can do is tell what their connections were or may have been. You can't tell what language they spoke with their mama at home nor what they considered themselves. And it really seems like the Dilmun merchants considered themselves 
as, I won't say independent from the rulers, but we always think in terms, political terms of hierarchy. And we see this with the Dillman tombs, the big ones, the middle ones, all the little small ones. But there is another organizing principle in human behavior, and that's called heterarchy, where instead of being a vertical, big, medium, little, you have horizontal networks of communication and association. You help me, I help you, we get the stuff done. We influence each other not by bashing heads or building bigger tombs, but by facilitating and of course, trade is a common exemplar of this heterarchical distribution of power. Because what do we see in the Gulf? We see, and even in the Bahrain tombs, most of those tombs are small. There were a few big rulers. But most people, even who could afford these tombs, are middling. And that's where the trade gets done. You can order someone to do this, but if the guys who are loading the boats and the people who are packing the gear don't get along and don't cooperate, neither side's going to accomplish anything. And when we had looked at the seals from Bahrain, uh, from uh, uh, Phylica, and see how varied they can be, and the fact that Phylica is not a place where you're going to put down roots and build your big family tomb and show how important you are, but where you're going to get business done. It makes some sense in thinking of this heterarchical or horizontal layers of communication and influence. Because we know Zimmerlim's high on the hog at one point. He's doing very well. He, f he doesn't he insults Hammurabi in a variety of ways. Hammurabi takes him down. Doesn't stop the trade. What's going on? Because the traders don't really care. <laughs> they keep their heads down. They do their job. <laughs> but it facilitates long-term, deep connections between areas that are very far apart. In our 21st century, blinders, and a lot of this comes from our whole 19th century view of empires that control places. It doesn't last. But we always think of, oh, the big man, the two big men who go head to head. Well, they can't accomplish anything if there are not people who make things work on the ground level. So that this distribution of almost secondary power below the rulers who pat themselves in the back, call themselves a servant of the god Enzac and such, uh, and, and put up their big steelies with the sun god saying, yeah, these laws are good. They don't really make things happen. It's people like the Dillman merchants who continue the work. They may not figure in the annals of military figures and royal rulers, but they provide the pathway which those powers are exerted. Once again, not big and splashy, but the center point connecting the rulers, the trade, and international connections in the second millennium BCE. Thank you.